Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Applying Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Applying Ethology webinar. I am Laura Whalen, a postdoctoral researcher at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. As we begin today, I want to remind you all to please turn off your camera and microphone. Should you have questions for our speaker, please type them in the chat box, and we will address them at the end of this presentation. It is a pleasure today to introduce Saeed Shafi Sabet. Saeed is an assistant professor at the University of Golan, where he teaches and researches the effects of anthropogenic sound on fish behavior. Today, Saeed will present his research on ornamental red cherry shrimps' responsiveness to an acoustic stimulus. Saeed, welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Laura, for your good uh, introduction. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to share uh, part of my results in uh, today's uh, presentation uh, with the title Responsiveness to an Acoustic Stimulus in the Ornamental Red Cherry Shrimp. This work has been done by Sasan Azankana, Laura Lopez Grico, and also me as well. Okay. Let's move to the next slide. Okay. So, Jacusto years ago mentioned that the can, the can takes you deep into the silent world. So he made a series of documentaries and he described underwater environment as a silent world. He, and he, interestingly, he won a prize in 1956 for his documentary series. But now, we know something is going on in the underwater environment. You can hear. So as you can hear, the underwater world is filled with abiotic and biotic sounds. Well, sound can be used for mate attraction. It can also be used for ter territorial competence. Of course, for predator avoidance. Also sound can be used for prey detection as well and sandscape orientation. So we can see several species in this slide. They can use sounds for different purposes. Well, also fish larvae and juveniles can also use sounds for their orientation activities like sandscape orientation. So they can search habitats with kind of sounds. sounds these guys can use sounds, for instance, in coral reefs, that we can hear an example of sound in coral reefs because it Here, different sound sources, like biotic sound sources, like clicking shrimps, sound produced by some fish species, and also orchids as well. They can produce sound when they are moving or they are eating. So these guys, fish larvae, can also use sounds for their navigation. Well, fish can use sound to avoid from predators, but this guy was not enough successful to avoid from the predator. And of course, fish can use sounds to find their prey. And sometimes that would be dangerous for us. Many fish species communicate with sounds. On the left side, we can see croakers that they produce sounds to communicate with each other and we call specifics. Right side, another fish species that also can produce sounds for communication purposes, drums. Okay, so in this graph, we can see on the x axis frequency range and a couple of 
invertebrate species, fish species, and marine mammals. And the dashed lines represent hearing range of humans. So we can see there are many species with different hearing abilities. Sometimes there is kind of overlapping, and sometimes there is different hearing distances. But the interesting thing is that sound produced by human activities exactly overlapping the hearing range of many fish species. So there are anthropogenic sounds can produce different temporal pattern of exposure. On the left side, you have pile driving land, but it can't vibrate through the water and can produce vibration. You can hear. Well, this was the kind of intermittent sound exposure, like boom, boom, boom. But of course, we have other temporal patterns like this. Wind means with that big turbine can produce also a kind of continuous sound exposure, but a little bit mild. So shipping activities, boating, recreation for recreational, recreational purposes, they, that they, the engine can produce sound a little bit louder because it's in the on the water. So many sound sources that can be involved in underwater environment, both in, in the ocean and also in sea and also in freshwater habitats. Well, what we can see, is, sorry, sun in the underwater environment can be very important because the sound of Antarctic sun may be extra survey on the water related to air, well, because of sound travels better than in air and also it attenuates less on the water. And in such a murky environment that we can see here, sound can be a useful tool to be used for many species to navigate, to communicate with each other and to do a lot of things in underwater environment. And of course, visual signals are of little use underwater, as you can see here. So sound can be very useful tool for these purposes. So potential effects of sound exposure, it depends to the level of sound exposure and also relative distance from noise or sound source. We would have in proximity to sound source and relative low distance to sound source, we would have this rupturing uh, very uh, important organs of uh, fish or other species. And with some distance from the sound source and relative distance from the sound and little bit quieter sounds, we would have kind of physiological effects. And then more distance from sound source, we would have temporary threshold shift, masking relevant sounds, and also behavior responses. Since then, we would have kind of non sound audible anymore, but it won't be anymore audible. So anthropogenic sound may affect aquatic animals in several ways. For instance, cause physical damage, mask relevant sounds, undermine courtship and reproduction, affect predator-prey interactions, of course, affect feeding performance. In the earlier study on the sticklebacks and as a predator and preying on water fleas, it has been shown that, well, I can say here, and move this one here. Yes, okay. On the X axis, we have ambient sound condition, brief sound condition, and prolonged sound condition. And on 
Y axis, we have discrimination error in proportion. What does it mean, distribution, dis discrimination error? It means that fish can distinguish between food item and non-food item. And here we can see that there is an impact of discrimination error when we expose them to sound exposure. So they are not able to discriminate correctly to distinguish between food item and non-food item comparing to sound, comparing to control condition. In another measurement, we can see that food handling error, food handling error is another uh, index to measure foraging performance in this species that you can see that when they detect food item, then they need to attack the food item and kind of ingest the food. So sometimes here we can see that in, again, we have on the x-axis, ambient condition, brief sound condition, and prolonged, prolonged sound condition, there is impact on food handling. So they had more food handling errors during sound exposure. It means that they ingest food item. Again, in sound treatments, they split it out. So they had more food handling error. And in overall foraging performance, we can see sticklebacks preying on butterflies. There are kind of more overall foraging efficiency in ambient condition comparing to both sound treatments in terms of brief, very short time sound exposure period or prolonged sound exposure. Okay, so sound exposure reduced foraging performance in sticklebacks. In another study, which has been done by our group, so on zebrafish preying on water fleas. On the X axis, we have different sound temporal patterns. We have ambient sound, we have continuous sound exposure, we have intermittent regular with high pulse rate, boom, 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 and we have intermittent regular with low pulse rate, kind of boom, four seconds, again, boom. So we have kind of more intervals, and we had also intermittent irregular sound pattern. What we can see here in terms of food handling error in proportion, so whether they were able to successfully ingest water fleas in, term, in this study, zebrafish, we can see that irrespective to the temporal pattern, zebrafish were less successful comparing to ambient condition to attack and get the food item. In another study, it mentioned that motorboat sound can also distract hermit crabs. So predators could approach more closely before they trigger an escape response. And also here we can see sound can also affect on invertebrate, another invertebrate. So hermit crab, here we can see on the x-axis, ambient sound, ship sound, and on y-axis number of individuals. So we can see there's kind of not distracted in ambient condition comparing to sound condition. So more shore craft had difficulties during sound exposure in terms of distraction. Well, our research question were: does experimental sound exposure cause changes in swimming and food search behavior in shrimps and also affect feeding behavior? So this is our experimental setup, as you can see here. And then we add food item, we let individual shrimps to acclimate for one hour, and then we remove the gate or open the gate, and then simultaneously recording video file. And also either we had ambient conditions, so playback of no sound, or playback of continuous sound exposure. So this would be when they came to the food item, we had also simultaneously sound exposure. In the first experiment to measure swimming, feeding changes. And in the second part, for feeding disruption experiment, we use the exactly same procedures, but this time we let the shrimp to come and find the food item. And then when they were at the right place, we play back either ambient conditions, so we played ambient sound exposure, or we played back 
continuous sound exposure. And this is our power spectral density that we had for playback. So on the X axis, we can see frequency range. And on the Y axis, we have sound pressure level in decibels, what we can see in control condition. And in the playback sound exposure, there's a difference for sound pressure levels uh, in uh, range of frequency that we are interested in that species shrimp can perceive sound. So there is a distinct difference in terms of sound pressure level here. Okay, let's go to the results part. Does sound affect swimming speed? Well, on the X axis, we have before opening the gate, ambient sound and sound treatment. And after opening the gate, what we can see here that on the Y axis, swimming speed, they had more swimming speed before opening the gate. But when we open the gate, they decreased their swimming speed, both in ambient and sound treatments. So we had kind of decrease in swimming speed, but it was not related to sound exposure because we have both in ambient and sound treatment a reduction. If we look, so this is um, 10 minutes before and 10 minutes during in average. And if we look a little bit with details, here we can see again before opening the gate and after opening the gate, we have 10 minutes before, 10 minutes during, and swimming speed again. And we have kind of small time span. We can see that there is kind of decrease in swimming speed significantly exactly with onset of sound exposure and opening the gate. But it came to kind of a habituation at the end of 10 minutes of exposure. So here we can see kind of sound, not sound related behavioral changes for shrimp, which we will discuss it later. And this graph, we can see exposition so we, this is our shrimp tank, and this is our sound source. We have ambient sound condition and sound exposure condition. Here we can see that it seems, but it's also of course significantly, seems that they stayed away shrimps when exposed to sound exposure from sound source, comparing to ambient condition. So spend more time away from sound source in terms of spatial distribution. And also in terms of food latency. So how, how much time took to find the food or to, 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 to approach the food item here, we can see again, ambient sound and sound exposure. So it took so much quicker for shrimp to approach to the food source comparing to our sound treatments. So there is a kind of impact of sound for latency to find the food source here. And also here we can see again for sound treatment, number of revisiting with food source. So it means that in ambient condition, they revisited shrimps, revisited more times comparing to sound treatments to food source. So they had more visiting to food source. They stayed around the food source, but in sound treatment, they stayed away. So they had kind of decrease in revisiting to food source that which we, we provided. And in this graph, we can see number of individuals that found their food or didn't find their food. So here we have an ambient condition, sound condition. We can see that in ambient condition, so this is the number of individuals of shrimps individually that we expose them to either sound or uh, control condition. They were more successful to find their food. If we compare it with sound exposure treatment, we can see that they had more trouble and they had more difficulties to find their food. And the much more number of these guys didn't find their food item. And here, again, this is kind of, uh, this was for, uh, I think, two minutes of uh, exposure and uh, we let them to find their food item. Here, they had kind of 10 minutes to find their food item. But we can see here, 
is that the number of individual at the, it seems that after 10 minutes, they start to find their food a little bit more comparing to this graph that we can see here. They had more troubles with onset of sound exposure and with, within two minutes and 10 minutes, they, they decreased the number of, uh, did they, uh, they find their food, but it's still, if we compare it with ambient condition, we can see it's very high. And in terms of distraction, so in, the, in terms of number of individuals, uh, on the Y axis, we have the numbers, and on the, on the X axis, we have ambient sound and sound uh, uh, treatment. But what we can see here, that more individuals distracted in sound treatment. So they were more stressed, they didn't, they either froze or they stay away from food source. So kind of distraction impacts or of sound on these species. Okay, so take our home message. A reduction in swimming speed was not sound related as we have already seen that in both ambient sound condition and also sound exposure condition, we had kind of a reduction in swimming speed. Well, that might be because of antipredatory behavior responses or Maybe when they entered, when they then we opened the gate and they entered to the new area and to the new arena, they were cautious about increasing or continue their swimming speed constantly. Shims behaviorally avoid noisy area close to the active speaker. Well, we have all the same behaviorally, but of course we need acoustic measurement as well, which is needed are needed to be acoustically approved as well. Sound exposure increased latency of the first contact with the food source, decreased the number of times they're visiting with their food source, and affected finding food for the first two minutes. And impressing, it, it is kind of impressing for us to know that even after 10 minutes, it's still it was quite high in terms of impacts of sound. And of course, caused feeding distraction as well, okay? So sound related behavioral changes may have negative impacts on feeding success, performance, risk assessment, and attention, and cause changes on time allocation for other vital activities. These sound related changes in activities may lead to detrimental impacts on reproduction success and cause fitness consequences. And of course, we know a little bit. We don't know a lot. More studies are needed. I would like to thank my collaborators, Sasan Azan Kanak and also Laura Lopez Grico. Of course, thank you for your attention and make some noise. I'm ready for questions. Sayed, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. I admit, I don't know a lot about shrimp behavior, so it was wonderful to, to be informed and thank you for, for sharing. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, I wonder if I might start with one myself. So in shrimp, you found that sound caused them to decrease their visits to a food source and also that they were distracted when they were feeding if they encountered sound. And so thinking big picture, and of course, as you said, with more research, do you think this might be the start of evidence that we need to think about ship path patterns uh, for people fishing, but also moving freight and people and also like where we put windmills. What do, what do you think about that? Sorry, Laura, could you please repeat your question? I, I think I, I didn't understand it correctly. 
Yeah, so you found that the shrimp were very sensitive to sound and it really affected their feeding behavior. And so thinking about the anthropogenic sound in oceans, they, I, for example, all of the ship noises went for boats and things of that nature. And so do you think that this, of course, with more research could be the start of evidence that we need to be more careful about where ships are allowed to go and and when they're allowed to go in places to avoid affecting animal feeding behavior? Well, actually, yes, interesting question. Well, we, we have, uh, we know uh, about fish species that anthropogenic sound in their natural world, for instance, uh, shipping activities change their uh, swimming activities and their, and their movement in terms of vertical movements and they, uh, during weekends or during holidays. So they change accordingly because of boating, recreational activities, when they want to eat food at the surface, so they stay away from the surface when they are during holidays, shipping activities. But in this case for shrimps, we don't, I think it's hard to say. I think there, there would be at, at least some instant and, um, uh, how can I say, acute uh, impacts on them. But I would say, uh, well, we don't have enough data on, on these species uh, or even for invertebrates a lot uh, in, in the natural world. For instance, it is very interesting that even different species in terms of in invertebrates, for instance, shrimps, and crabs, they behave differently even in mesocosm when they expose them to the sound exposure, whether they still feed or stay away or distract. So for instance, crab distracted stay away from a food source when exposed to sound exposure, but shrimps didn't care about sound exposure and they continuously eat food items. So it's kind of, very hard to say. I mean, it's kind of a species is specific. So we need to be cautious if even we have any behavioral studies or behavioral observation in laboratory condition, it's very hard to interpret or, but I think there would be some impacts, of course. And we need to know. <laughs> Sorry. I no, say. that was great. Thank you, Sayed. Birta says, interesting subject. How do we know that added sounds cause a distraction? Could it be that the added sound masks more subtle sounds used in forging that we do not easily measure? Can you see the question maybe? Is that it on chat box? Yes, it's in the chat box. So it, the question is that when the sound was played in the experiment, perhaps that sound was more that it disturbed the shrimp's vocalizations or other sounds that they use when they're foraging and that actually caused them not necessarily to be distracted, but to miss single, miss important signals. Yeah. Yeah, interesting question. Hard to 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 our response. Yeah, well, could it be that they had a sound mask more subtle? Sound? Well, at least in our experimental setup, we when we exposed them to sound exposure, there were not other sound sources. I mean, it, it was kind of as uh, as much as possible the same condition for both ambient and sound treatments. But I. It is very important to notice that maybe even in such environments, in our experiment even, because of vibration, if there are other vibration, that maybe vibration can also change their behavior instead of not only sound pressure, so vibration in terms of particle motion, because we didn't measure in our experimental set of particle motion, which I think it is very important for those guys because they can perceive particle motion vibration as well. So if there are any vibration that might mask sound exposure, that is also an interesting item to measure. Are there any vibration or are there any masking 
how can I say, acoustic components, not sound pressure, but acoustic component in terms of, for instance, particle motion or not. But it's very interesting to, to explore. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that answer. Uh, another question from Katrina. Thank you, Sayed. Sorry, what exactly was your sound treatment? Uh, was it the sound of a boat? Uh, and what was your hypothesis on swimming speed? So maybe start with, what did you use to make the sound? Well, actually, we didn't use uh, exactly record the sound of the boat or uh, boats, but the pattern, we generated the sound via software to, to avoid from soda replication. So if we only use one boating uh, recording, that would be also, we have kind of solar replication, but we use uh, generated sound exposure and then we band pass filter in exactly the hearing range of uh, these species, which is kind of in a, at the lower frequency. So we, if I remember correctly, the high pass and low pass or sound treatments the pattern was boating activities pattern, so continuous sound exposure, and uh, the, the high low pass was from 500 uh, till, if I remember, 2000 hertz. So from 500 till 2000 hertz. So this is the frequency range, but the lower part is more interesting for this species because we are more sensitive to lower uh, frequencies. And uh, what was your hypothesis on swimming speed? Well, we were interested to see whether sound exposure may affect the uh, spatial displacement, but we also measure swimming activities as, as well. But the interesting thing is that we think, as at least we think that instead of swimming speed, we can propose because they don't uh, swim a lot in this species. They, they have kind of movement. So I would suggest we can analyze or we can explore their movement behavior that is more natural. So when they are more happy, they move. So they walk, I can say walk or something. They, they are connected to substratum or the border of the uh, container. So uh, yeah. I yeah, I, I might just push you a bit on that because you mentioned at the end that you thought that swimming speed might have been a sign of anti-predator behavior. And so do you think that more swimming speed is a good thing for shrimp or it uh, could be a sign of something's not right with their environment? Well, I think... Uh when we open the gate, they decrease their swimming speed. So, uh, so I think that might be more related to because they enter to the new area and maybe they, they don't use, uh, so they, they don't uh, tend to use swimming uh, in the arena when they are uh, in the, natural condition. So if they are, maybe, I don't know, maybe if we expose them to an uh, aerial predator or in the, or by the fish, they, 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 they trigger to swim more. So they increase their swimming. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think this decrease in both sound treatment and control treatment, which is very interesting for us, is more not related to sound exposure at all, but is related to kind of, avoiding behavior or cautious behavior when they are experiencing a new arena for the first time because they don't have any experience so they are cautious to 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 swim or to yeah to 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 to, to move okay great thank you for clarifying that you're welcome. So we have a comment from Marta. Thank you for the presentation. What other species do you think might be especially, especially vulnerable to anthropogenic noise, but are not yet well studied? And what made you decide to study uh, these ornamental shrimp?
It's very hard question. It's very studies. Well, I think there are studies on uh, fish and uh, especially uh, marine fish species and also freshwater fish species. But I think it's still in terms of the importance of invertebrates and crustaceans, we don't have enough studies yet to, to explore how anthropogenic sound may affect their behavior. So I cannot say, I cannot nominate any species for in terms of uh, invertebrate or crustaceans, but we don't know. So there is limited uh, studies. We have some studies on crabs. We have studies on comparing shrimps and crabs and also uh, uh, red terrestrian. If you look for red terrestrial, you cannot find a lot of uh, sound studies on these species as well. So I think, uh, well, as long as all species I think are important, so we need to know more about the pattern that we can see when the exploding. It is not related to whether they are traditional or whether they are economic or not. Even non-economic species are also important because they are also in our food web as well. So if the impact them, that might vulner, how can I say, reverberate at the community level as well. Yeah. Great. And what made you decide to study ornamental shrimp? Well, actually, uh, the first uh, thing that I was wondering, because this species is kind of gregarious species, and it's kind of, or, uh, so it can be in some environments as an invasive species. Yeah, in different environments, but not in, here in Iran, but in other countries. Maybe there are some uh, countries that uh, know that in, uh, it is an invasive species. It, it is interesting for me to, to know whether anthropogenic sound may also affect invasive species as well or not. So is this species also is, uh, I'm say, typical species for doing the biological studies and uh, for uh, reproduction purposes as it, it is uh, as an ornamental species and it's kind of gregarious and it can uh, distribute in many uh, aquatic habitats. So it would be also interesting to know whether sound exposure produced by human activities might also affect this gregarious and maybe invasive species in the near environments or not. Great, thanks for those answers. Henshorg says, hi Sayed, thanks for the fantastic talk. Could it be that the vibration caused by the speaker alone is the actual cue the shrimp respond to and not the sound? I know it is a tricky question, but I'm very interested to hear what you think, thanks. Great, yeah, this is also an interesting question. I'm very curious to, to measure particle motion in this uh, arena because yes, uh, Hans, <clears throat> great question. Well, I think they are, yeah, sensitive to particle motion component. And yeah, as long as I don't have any <clears throat> field, completely field acoustic measurement of sound exposure, whether there are kind of gradient of sound exposure in my field, because we didn't measure the whole arena to make, we are working to, to kind of manipulate and uh, how can I say, visualize three dimension, three dimension of, um, or sound uh, pressure arena, but yet we don't have any idea, but I think it's more related to sound <coughs> particle motion that you mentioned, yes. But yeah, of course, we didn't measure it yet, but interestingly, Hans, because I think because this <coughs> speaker was uh, kind of uh, in a small arena in our very small fish tank, and also all uh, uh, fish, uh, how can I say, shrimp or fish uh, tank ball can reverberate as a secondary source of sound and uh, produce uh, both sound pressure and also of course particle motion. So I think, yeah, 
is more likely that the, 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 these effects would be because of particle motion instead of sound exposure. I completely agree with you, yeah. But yeah, still, uh, I don't have any measurement of particle motion, which I'm very interested to measure this uh, uh, component, sound component, yeah. <laughs> Great question, thank you, Hans. Alawasian says, what is the minimal sound intensity tolerable by a shrimp? Ah, this is very hard question. What is the minimal sound intensity tolerable by shrimps? It's very hard. In terms of absolute numbers, I cannot help at all. <laughs> it's very hard. But yeah, it's the, in terms of absolute numbers, it depends to the stage of uh, animal. It depends to the, whether it's female or male or, yeah, it's very hard to do. And also the distance between uh, sound source and the individual that we expose them and the, the exact location that they uh, experience the sound playback is very hard to, 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 to give a number in this. But I can say that our ambient condition in this experiment was almost 90, 94, 95 decibel, but our uh, sound exposure level was 107, 107 till 108. So there were kind of more than six decibels, which is needed to, 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 to have kind of behavior response. How can change I don't have any idea about uh, six options, but yeah, <laughs> that would be an interesting question. Also. Well, great. That was a lot of questions. And thank you, Said, so much for taking the time to give such thoughtful answers. And thank you again for such a beautiful presentation. I think we all learned a lot and uh, look forward to hearing what more you find out about shrimp. <laughs> thank you very much, Laura.